Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward, and this is Face to Face. Our guest this week is Anishinaabe author and journalist Wabgijik Rice. Wab, who is originally from Wasasking First Nation, has spent the majority of his career with the public broadcaster, doing both radio and television. His most recent book, Moon of the Crusted Snow, was released in 2018 to praise, and because of its content has had a resurgence during the COVID-19 pandemic. Wab recently announced he was leaving the CBC to work on a sequel to the novel. Wob, well, thanks so much for joining us. A real pleasure to have you on the show here. Uh, let's start with Moon of the Crusted Snow because it has been on the minds of many. And for those unfamiliar with the book here, the tagline is, as one society collapses, another is reborn. With winter looming, a small northern Anishinaabe community goes dark and is cut off from power and communication with the outside world. Maybe I'll let you pick it up from there. Yeah, miigwech, Dennis. Uh, thanks a lot for having me. It's an honor to be on your show and really looking forward to chatting with you today. Uh, yeah, Moon of the Crested Snow essentially came about uh, as a result of living through the blackout of 2003. And just sort of seeing how my own community responded to that and also being a fan of dystopian and post-apocalyptic fiction at the same time. Um, at the end of all that, when things sort of returned to normal after a couple of days, I really reflected on how people in my community really came together and figured out ways to be resourceful amongst one another in the face of this sort of unknown catastrophe. And I thought back to a lot of the books I read growing up that sort of examined these moments of crisis and of world's ending. And I thought, you know, the Nishabe response or the, I guess, more broad Indigenous response is a lot different. You know, I think People from Indigenous backgrounds know what uh, having a world end is like, and, you know, they've sort of picked up the pieces and, you know, have created new communities and, and I guess, modified cultures at the same time um, in the face of these catastrophes, right, and in the face of ongoing colonialism. So I was pretty inspired to try to uh, explore a story like that on my own through an Indigenous lens. And I think there's uh, some hope there that can really resonate with a lot of people. So, yeah, the story is essentially about a community that endures a blackout, a Northern Ontario community. And uh, there's a lot of mystery around what has happened. And out of the blue, uh, the community gets visitors from the city to the south and is forced to sort of make some dire decisions about its future and how it's going to survive uh, because it's clear that this catastrophe encountered in the book is pretty widespread and um yeah from there it's just a, a a bit of renewal i guess at the same time reconnecting with the land and reconnecting with culture and finding ways to be good citizens be good community members with one another the book was uh, very well received back uh, when it came out it was released in, in 2018 and uh, you know, made some short lists uh, and was nominated. Uh, but it has seen a resurgence uh, during this global pandemic. Uh, why do you feel like it's resonating with people? Uh, well, I think the story itself is about that moment of crisis. And uh, it, it sort of examines what that initial reaction can be in a community and how people, you know, would respond to having, you know, the world sort of I guess, essentially hang by a thread in, in their perspective, right? Uh, so I don't think there are too, too many parallels between what we're going through now and the story, other than those, I guess, moments of panic and moments of mystery, right? Um, yeah. um, so it's, it's interesting to see that. Um, but if anything, I just hope it prompts people to take a look at their current situations, at their communities, you know, at the ways they get food, at the ways they organize and sort of relate with people in their own communities, maybe find ways to, I guess, sort of hit the reset button and, and renew and find a positive path forward. You talk about the, the parallels and, and whether there are many or aren't, but one of the plot lines, as we mentioned, includes an unexpected non-Indigenous visitor from the South arriving in the community. This literally did happen during the pandemic when a Quebec couple flew to Old Crow Yukon uh, well, what was uh, I, I, you got contacted by the media <laughs> even over that one yeah that was weird man like 
it, again, you know, it was tagged in, in those articles that first went out around and some of those first social media posts about this couple that went up there. And it was just really bizarre to, to see it unfold that way. Um, the reason I wrote about that in the story, why that was a major plot point, was because it was supposed to be an allegory for ongoing colonialism, right? Mm -hmm. You know, just to show people that, you know, colonialism isn't over. You know, there are forces that seek to further exploit Indigenous people and their communities and sort of have a privileged ideology about what it means to, I guess, use Indigenous communities in that way. Like, people just assume that they can go somewhere and, and be accepted, and that's where they're going to live out this crisis kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. And that was always going to be a major plot point in Moon of the Crested Snow. And when I started writing it, I wasn't really sure if that was possible, you know? Like, I got about a month into actually filling out the prose and writing the, the paragraphs and sentences and so on, and I thought, w would people actually really do this? Would they leave the city and try to seek refuge in the res just because of a crisis? And, um, you know, I started having some serious doubts. And uh, I guess about a month in, uh, I was living in Ottawa at the time, and I went to a Halloween party there. And because I was, you know, had my head totally into apocalyptic stories and the, and the end of the world, I just, that was like what I talked to people about all the time, right? It was the topic that was front of mind. So I may not necessarily have been a fun dude to talk to uh, <laughs> all the time back then. But I, I happened to start, to start chatting with this dude who just said out of the blue, you know, like, if it all goes down, if the world ends, the first place I'm going is the red. And I, and I sort of thought, oh, that's, that's interesting. Uh, and I asked him, I said, why would you do that? And he said, well, you know, like, people there know how to live on the land. I could probably easily hide out and, you know, it'd just be a good place to be if, you know, everything is going down in the city. So I thought, I didn't say this to him. I was like, well, that's, that's pretty presumptuous that you think he could just go to a reserve and mm -hmm. be, you know, welcomed and accepted there. And I said, which res? And he's like, doesn't matter. The closest one I can get to kind of thing, right? So he sort of just you know, had this idea that he could go there. And I thought, you know, bingo, this is like the guy, this is who I'm writing about. So uh, there was one person there. So that sort of validated that um, element of the story for me. And uh, it wasn't meant to be like a sort of how-to guide or anything like that. But then here we have in this crisis, people, you know, fleeing from Quebec all the way to, to the far north, you know? So yeah, I thought it was really interesting for sure. And that he was going to go and hide out and not be noticed at all. Uh, well, but, <laughs> but more to talk about on this book and uh, your journalism career. Just need to step aside for a quick break, and then we'll continue the conversation here on Face to Face. Welcome back to Face to Face. Our guest this week is Anishinaabe writer and journalist Bob Gijek Rice, who spent 14 years as a journalist. And we're going to get to that right away, but we're still uh, discussing Wab's most uh, recent novel, Moon of the Crusted Snow. And Wab, uh, the end of the book, uh, I don't know if this was intentional, but it left me wanting more, expecting more selfishly. And there is more to come. Did you always have a sequel in mind? Uh, and what can you tell us about what is to come? No, I didn't. You know, when I first started dreaming up this story, I had the intention of leaving it just as a standalone story um, because I thought that was a good place to end it, you know, and without giving too much away about how the story ends. Mm -hmm. You know, I was satisfied with that sort of resolution. Uh, but people who read it, uh, you know, kept asking me, what happens next? You know, what is the future of this community? And I hadn't really considered it at all. You know, I sort of just left it there. So I was really encouraged uh, by readers who, you know, connected with this story and the characters in the community and wanted to see more. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm very, uh, very privileged, very fortunate to have this opportunity and I'm very thankful for it. So I'll, I can say, you know, the wheels are turning and we are looking at uh, the next steps in the story and it will take place about 10 years after the final moment in the book. And uh, readers will remember the stories about this community that had originally been displaced from the Great Lakes up to far northern Ontario, you know, which isn't unusual. That's part of Canadian history, um, mm -hmm. even though this is a, 
fictional community, right? Um, that's something that happened to many Indigenous nations. So this is going to be a story about a pocket of people from the community uh, heading south to see what's left of the world and also to try to reclaim their original homelands on the Great Lakes. So that's, uh, that's a brief, brief synopsis of hopefully what's to come. And excited to see what is to come. I did catch a part of your conversation on the chatting with the homies with Ian Campo and Jesse <laughs> Thistle, and they uh, asked the question that I was also wondering, is there any opportunity for a movie or television series even uh, out of the book? I, I hope so. You know, there, there are some things in the works. I can't really disclose what's happening uh, because there is, uh, again, initial discussions. But uh, I'm hopeful that we could see a limited series of, of the first part of the story. I don't know about the second part because that still has to come out. But, um, you know, I didn't write it thinking that it would be adapted to the screen. But, I mean, I am a very visual storyteller. And, you know, it's important for me to have some accurate reflections uh, visually in, in, you know, my writing. So if there are uh, filmmakers who believe it can fit well on the screen, then I am totally into that. And, and I would be honored to have it taken to the screen. Yeah, I would love to see that. Uh, the day after that chatting with the homies, we had uh, Blood Quantum director Jeff Barnaby on for Face to Face. And I was oh, cool. thinking, oh man, uh, well, that would be a great team up. Um, <laughs> well, part of this uh, decision, you know, to, to write the sequel is your decision to step aside for now, I guess, from journalism. Was that a, a difficult decision for you? Oh yeah, definitely. You know, I've been making a living off journalism uh, for 18 years now. I graduated from Raritan back in 2002, and I've been at CBC for 14 years, and it's just been a very wonderful career, and I've had some truly memorable experiences and made some really, really awesome friendships over, you know, my time at CBC especially. But another really important thing, and I mentioned this uh, to, to Ian and Jesse as well, you know, as as uh, professionally fulfilling uh, as my CBC career has been, you know, it has been long hours every day, as I mentioned, and uh, I haven't been able to make as much time and space for my culture as I'd like to. You know, I was very fortunate to be raised, you know, in a time when my community and my family were really reconnecting with Nishnabe culture, and that was a, a big part of my daily routine was for cultural practices, right? And mm -hmm. I just don't feel like I'm doing enough of that right now in my day-to-day -day life. And I want my kids to be able to grow up with the same opportunities and same connection to culture that I had. So part of stepping away from full-time journalism is to make room for that. And um, that's not to say you can't be a full-time journalist and still do these things, but to the degree that I want to do them, you know, I, I have to make more space in my daily schedule, right? So. You know, we know how important uh, radio is in the, the communities, and uh, myself, having lived in Northern Ontario, I know how important the Up North show is to Northern Ontario. Was that kind of a, a dream gig for you to take over as host of that show? Oh, it totally was. It, it has been the highlight of my journalism career for sure, and um, it, it's been a career highlight because, you know, there is such a strong Nishinaabe and Meshkego Cree presence in Northern Ontario that I've really uh, made great efforts to highlight. That's sort of been my uh, MO in this position is to put the spotlight on Indigenous communities. And I've had the editorial freedom and encouragement to do that. And it's just been so, uh, you know, positively overwhelming for me to have this opportunity every day to connect with the Indigenous communities especially, but also every other community in Northern Ontario, right? Because I do believe this is an overlooked part of the country. And uh, what's happening here is de definitely precedent setting in a lot of ways, right? Just how the social fabric is sort of evolving to include more Nishnabe and Mishkego Cree um, influences. So to be able to put that on display every day on the radio has just been awesome. Yeah, and I want to touch more on that, uh, Wab. We just have to throw to uh, one more quick break here, and then we'll continue the conversation on Face to Face.
Welcome back to Face to Face. Our guest this week is Anishinaabe writer and journalist Wab Gijik Rice. And Wab, before the uh, break, we were talking about the importance of radio and culture. And one of the things you strive to do for the radio show you hosted was a near weekly segment on Indigenous languages in Northern Ontario. Can you talk about why that was important for you and how it was received? Yeah, that was probably one of my favorite parts uh, in sort of our weekly routine. But then we knew that the uh, United Nations uh, International Year of Indigenous Languages was coming up uh, in 2019. Mm. So from there, I just sort of started collecting contacts and talking to people and trying to figure out how to, uh, un I guess, unfold the, the coming uh, initiative of highlighting these Indigenous languages. So it was really, really fun. Um, I think there are, you know, just a few languages spoken in Northern Ontario. There's the uh, Nishnabemwin, uh, Mishkego Cree, and, and Oja Cree. And uh, it was just a matter of reaching out to places uh, all over, you know, the region. And, you know, speaking with not only teachers, but elders and just regular community members who have that close connection with their language as well. Um, the idea wasn't, like, to have weekly lessons although that was a part of it, you know, we would share every week some words or phrases in, in the language. But I think it was important for me to highlight that, you know, these connections that we have with languages are, are sort of thinning and, and a lot of them are at risk of disappearing. So we wanted to highlight initiatives to make sure that language stays strong. And I guess the personal connection that people have with language, right? You know, we, we would talk to people whose parents went to residential school and they wanted to bring the language back as a result of that or people who you know became teachers because they didn't really have a connection in the beginning maybe they grew up in a city or they moved to northern ontario after that right mm -hmm. and i guess people who were just proud of being able to speak it still and wanted to share some fun and interesting things and you know it was cool to sort of put the spotlight on the grassroots grassroots initiatives especially you know people who were doing it for the sake of love you know who were only doing it not for recognition, not for any kind of shine, but just to make sure that people had this, this connection with their language. So we did it almost every Monday, and uh, the response was great. You know, we would put calls out to people saying, if there's something you want to share, or if there's someone you think we should talk to, just let us know. And almost every week we had something new to discuss, you know, whether it was like uh, weather terminology, and even just recently we had like COVID-19 related terminology, mm -hmm. and um yeah, it was really fun. And, you know, it's important for me to try to reconnect with my language, too. You know, I grew up on the reserve with it being spoken around me, but I didn't really learn it properly, right? Because this was, you know, a time in the 1980s and 1990s when there were still sort of the repercussions of colonialism. I mean, those repercussions continue today. But back then, you know, there wasn't, there was still a deep shame associated with speaking the language. So I wasn't able to pick it up properly. And it's sort of been a, journey I've been on now to try to learn it, um, you know, being inspired by some of my family members, like my brother, Miskwankwit, specifically. Uh, so that's another one of the reasons why I, I'm leaving my full-time work is to be able to spend, you know, more than just my lunch hour, you know, studying the Shnabemwin, you know. I remember the uh, Toronto Raptors playoff run there was uh, a oh, yeah. big one as well. Uh, Wab, I, I know, uh, I don't know if you'd agree with this, but I, I can say with certainty for a new generation of journalists, seeing you on TV, hearing you on the radio was uh, an inspiration for many uh, here on the prairies for sure. Was Did you feel like a, a trailblazer at all? And, and who were some of the journalists that inspired you? Oh, well, to me, Gwaj, thank you. Um, that really means a lot to me. Uh, just knowing that, you know, some young people may have, have seen the work that I do and may have been encouraged by that as well. Uh, I don't feel like I'm a trailblazer. You know, I feel like I'm following in the path of people like Bernalda Wheeler, uh, Jim Compton, Rick Ratty, uh, Duke Redbird. Uh, it goes on, you know, for people who are doing important work in journalism uh, decades ago, um, likely facing much harder challenges than we do today and even that I did, you know, starting out in the early 2000s as a professional journalist. So, that softened the blow for sure. And I know there are ongoing issues in newsrooms uh, in media uh, organizations in terms of representation, you know. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we just don't have that critical mass of Indigenous journalists across the board yet, which we really need to 
effectively educate the rest of Canada about the history of this land and what some of the current issues are. And I think that really needs to, to start at the top. I think we need more Indigenous people in management uh, positions in the mainstream organizations. I know ABTN obviously is a great example of how to do this properly and, and effectively. But I think other mainstream organizations need to really follow a lead uh, of ABTN and other organizations that you know have that sort of structure of awareness and understanding because if that can't trickle down then the journalism work itself is just going to suffer you know if you have young indigenous journalists trying to pitch stories about what's important in their communities and what canadians should know about and their bosses don't understand it and don't take those pitches then everybody loses right and if we talk about reconciliation and the need to understand what the real history of this country is that's just never going to happen until that critical mass happens so I think it's incumbent on media organizations to have this awareness ingrained into their actual structures in order to, I guess, benefit all of Canadians, really. Um, so I was able to, to sort of fall into work like that because of those trailblazers that I mentioned. And that's not to say it wasn't difficult for me. There are, were a lot of really trying times, and I almost quit many, many times because I didn't feel like I was, um, I didn't feel like I was part of, uh, you know, uh, an organ or a newsroom that maybe valued these stories. You know, this mm -hmm. came up in, in almost every place that I worked, right? So it, it was really a, a battle a lot of times to get some of these stories on the air and to, you know, convince my superiors that these are people we need to talk to and these are voices that need to be heard. So things have improved. Um, you know, if I think back to when I started in how I'm leaving, uh, there have been some great improvements, but there's still a long way to go. Well, I have so many things uh, that we're not going to get to talk to, including the, the playlist for the book, which uh, you and I share uh, a love for a lot of the same music. I guess uh, one <laughs> final question. Uh, can we agree that the, the Toronto Maple Leafs probably would have won the Stanley Cup this year <laughs> if the uh, <laughs> season hadn't been paused? That's funny because uh, I only remembered this the other day, but there's a scene in Moon of the Crescent Snow where they're talking about hockey, and the one character says, oh, I think the Leafs would have done it this year, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so here we are, unsure if hockey's going to come back, and, uh, you know, there's no surefire way the Leafs would have won it all, but, um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see if they come back with some sort of modified format, and the funny thing is I saw somebody tweet this yesterday that if – you know, they did have this modified tournament for the Stanley Cup and the Leafs actually won. Uh, they'd have that aster asterisk by their name forever and they of wouldn't course. be able to actually have a Stanley Cup parade, you know? Yeah. So, the jokes would continue in perpetuity. So everybody wins in that sense, right? Well, until the season resumes, we'll claim that they could have won it all. But, uh, <laughs> well, but unfortunately, that is all the time we do have. Thanks so much for being on the show and nothing but uh, hopes for continued success for you. Miigwech, Dennis. It was an honor to join you today. Thanks a lot for having me on. Keep up the great work. And that is also the end of this season of Face to Face. A big thanks to our 31 guests we squeezed into this season. And you can catch up on any of those episodes you may have missed by visiting our website, aptnnews.ca. And, of course, all the shows are also available as podcasts. You can find those at aptnnews.ca slash face to face podcast. A huge thanks to our crew behind the scenes, to Red Sharon as well, and a special shout out to the wizard, Wilfred Moore, who makes sure we get the show to air every week. And of course, thanks to all of you for tuning in to Face to Face. I'm Dennis Ward, have a great night.